starting this year with hope and uh, a lot of momentum and uh, we would like to wish health and success to every one of our friends in the analyst and investor community. Across the globe, the new variants of the COVID-19 virus are spreading rapidly. This wasn't unexpected, but it's a damper now, nonetheless. As I said to all our colleagues at Wipro, mask up, take your vaccines, and let's help stop the spread of this virus. Now, despite the pandemic, we have delivered the fifth consecutive quarter of excellent performance strong growth in revenues, acceleration in bookings, sustained operating margin, and solid operating cash flow. I want to thank every one of our employees who helped us achieve this. These results reflect their passion, their dedication, and inventiveness. And I must say I was really glad to see that our colleagues have taken the time to attend to their health and well-being while continuing to serve our clients with integrity and will. Looking at our financials, our revenue growth during the quarter was at 3% in constant currency terms and 27.5% year on year. In the first nine months of this year, we have grown at 28% year on year. This is nearly six times faster than the average growth rate we've had in the last 10 years. We've been consistently growing at or over 3% for five quarters now. And frankly, this is because of our improved execution abilities and followed through on our business strategy that was established in November 2020. Our growth continues to be broad-based across all our key markets, service offerings, and most of our sectors. We have added about 34,000 new employees on a net basis in the past nine months. To give you a sense of proportion and pace, we actually have added in three quarters what took us 11 quarters in the past. Now, looking forward, the demand environment continues to be robust. Our growth rate, our pipeline, and our order bookings all reflect that. Our pipeline, in fact, shows a healthy mix of medium and large deals across all our business lines. We also continue to see rapid expansion in small and mid-sized deals, which really represents growth in our existing accounts as well as expansion of our market portfolios. Order books, which is frankly the best measure of the demand environment, has grown 27% on a year-to-date basis in terms of annual contract value. In fact, our bookings have been the highest ever. And in Q3, we saw a 50% year-on-year increase in the total contract value order booking for deals in the 10 to 30 million dollar range. What I feel stands out is that our win rate in the market has improved dramatically. For this year, our win rate has expanded 300 basis points. This is clearly a reflection of our strategy, the cultural shift we've been pushing, as well as the services we are now being recognized for. And I think it's also a reflection of our impact on our client's business. As expected, um, we are seeing the benefit of, cons- of Capco's consulting edge in our large deal pipeline. We are now winning in cloud transformation, in engineering services, data, digital transformation, and security. Our clients are continuing to place their trust in us to let them turn into digital businesses. On the M&A front, we have continued to pursue aggressively on our strategy fit. We announced two completion of two acquisition, the completion of two acquisitions in Q3. The first one is Agile, 
transformational cybersecurity consulting provider that focuses on risks and compliance, on information and cloud security and digital identity. Agile is definitely um, recognized by security and risk leaders for its very unique business aligned cybersecurity capability for their deep understanding of the changing regulatory environment and enabling cloud transformation that help secure the modern enterprise. The second acquisition that we completed was Lean Swift Solutions, a US headquartered system integrator of Info products, whose service capabilities include ERP, e-commerce, digital transformation, supply chain, warehouse management system, business intelligence, and of course, integration. This acquisition will expand the capabilities of Wipro's full stride cloud services. So we're very excited about these acquisitions and we welcome so many new colleagues from Agile and Meetswift into Wipro recently. On operating margins at 17.6%, in Q3, we are ahead of our stated range of 17, 17.5%. These margins were delivered after an incremental two month impact of salary increases in September that covered 80% of our colleagues globally and an equity grant for our senior colleagues. And we continue, frankly, to invest heavily in our business across sales transformation, capabilities, and talent. I will now provide some final details on markets, on service offerings and sectors, right, as always. Americas and Europe, our top two markets, grew at 28% and 38% respectively for the quarter, in your on your terms. In Americas, one, we grew 23% year-on-year and 5.2% sequential, with all sectors showing strong growth. Communication, media, information services grew 30%. Consumer goods and life science grew 25%. Healthcare and medical device grew 16% year-on-year. Now, looking at America too, we grew 33% year-on-year with a strong growth across BFSI and manufacturing. The order book, in terms of annual contract value, grew over 47% year-on-year. Frankly, this was led by good overall bookings in the bucket of 10 to $30 million. Our European business has delivered an outstanding year-on-year -year growth of 38%. Germany, the largest market in Europe, has almost doubled. Benelux grew 24%, and our UK business grew 40% year on year. The momentum on the Louis have accelerated this quarter, and our pipeline has several large yields above the $100 million range. We are frankly confident about how they are shaping up as well. I'm sure you know where we were with our European business a year ago. So it's a great turnaround story here. Finally, our Apnea market grew at 13% year on year. All our major markets are growing sequentially. Overall, the order booking in TCB terms are looking healthy with 37% year on year growth, excluding acquisitions, of course. And in my mind, this should definitely uh, support the growth agenda in this market in the coming quarters. But one of our key pillars of our strategy is to grow our existing large accounts and deepen the relationship. So let's look at that. Our top five customers grew 36% year-on-year. Our top 10 customers grew 37% year-on-year. In the last 12 months, we've added seven customers in the more than $100 million bracket and nine new customers in the more than $50 million bracket. This is 
I believe a significant shift, one that we believe will continue. From a service offering standpoint, we have two big global business lines. Our IDS global business line grew 37% year on year. Most of the sub practices showed a healthy growth. Our engineering business grew over 26% year on year in Q3 and grew at a compounded quarterly growth rate of over 6% in the last four quarters. Our ICOR global business line grew by 17% year on year. Again, most sub practices grew in double digits on a year on year basis too. Uh, digital operations and platform led the growth with 18%. We also continue to invest in and strengthen our partnership with hyperscales and industry leading platform players. We, in fact, expanded our go to market approach with cloud and with application partners now, resulting in us driving leading edge solutions in the market. We pose, therefore, more visible in the market because of this. We are driving proactive solution development and campaigns with our partners on both horizontal and vertical solutions. All of this resulting in an increasing number of multi-partner wins. Our order bookings that were a result of going to market together with our partners grew 40% year on year. This is the highest ever. Our cloud ecosystem revenues also grew um, and grew at an accelerated pace of 30% on the year-to-date basis. Now, let me give you a sense of the kind of deals we're winning. One, we won a strategic service now implementation engagement from a large Brazil-based oil and gas company to transform the IT processes, increase agility, and quality of services to business areas. Leveraging Wipro Full Stride Cloud Services, this is a significant ServiceNow implementation in the Latin America market. Second, a US headquartered financial services institution that has awarded us a contract to transform the core banking functionality of their retail portfolio. Wipro here will leverage its domain and technology transformation capabilities to bring in design thinking methodologies, improve agility, and obviously increase business value for the client. There are more examples we're sharing, but I'd like to now focus on our biggest success factor, talent. Our focus on building world-class talents remains more than ever. We've worked very hard to ensure that scale is never a constraint for growth. We are, of course, uh, we are on course to onboard over 70% more fresh talent from the campus in FY22 versus the previous year. I would not surprise you if I said that attrition is a reality across the most old industries. It's been no different for us. I had shared with you last quarter that we expect attrition to slow down only after a few more quarters. However, we now feel more confident of um, having stabilized our attrition rate in Q3 and expect it to moderate next quarter. When we embarked on our transformation in 2020, we had committed to creating a vibrant, diverse, and a more local leadership team. We've made progress on every count. Our leadership has moved closer to clients. The presence of senior leadership in locations outside India has improved by 13 percentage points. It's also relevant to note that nearly 50% of our leadership hires have been in the growth office and in the customer facing uh, global account executive roles, which are strengthening our front line and so. Over the last 18 months, we have improved ethnic diversity in our senior leadership by 20 percentage points and gender diversity in the leadership has nearly doubled. Without a doubt, we have more work to do here, but I'm pretty proud of the change we are seeing in Wipro thus far. 
Now, we are committed to being a company that respects diversity, works to talk on the inclusion, and is a beacon for change within our industry, it's very clear. On an even more current and urgent topic, I'd like to reaffirm that the health and safety of all our employees remain our topmost priority. With the rapidly spreading Omicron variant of the COVID-19 virus, we remain very vigilant. As a proactive measure, we have decided to close our offices globally for the next four weeks. It's of some relief to us that 90% of our employees globally are now vaccinated with, with one dose of the vaccine, and over 65% are fully vaccinated with the recommended two doses. Our plans to return to office, even in a hybrid model for our fully vaccinated employees, will be calibrated in the context of the evolving situation, keeping both our employee safety and client preferences in mind. That said, of course, we are continuing to service our clients with dedication and agility as always. Same with topics of great urgency. Our sustainability efforts have continued with great momentum. You may know we have been included in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index again for the 12th time in a row. A testament to our consistent ongoing efforts in this area. Climate change and our ecological and carbon footprint is something we take very, very seriously. Finally, onto our outlook for the next quarter, we have guided for a revenue growth of 2 to 4%, which will translate into a full year growth of 27 to 28%. To summarize, the demand environment continues to be robust, and our growth path over the last few quarters reflects this. We'll stay on course with the strategic priorities I had shared with you in November, and I'm confident of sustaining the growth momentum we have so far displayed. Right? On that note, uh, let me welcome Jatin for his comments on the financials. Jatin, over to you. Thank you very much, Thierry, and thank you all for joining our earnings call. I will quickly summarize the financial details. As you know, we have grown 28.5% on a year-on-year -year basis on a rupee revenue on, on, in rupee terms. Our margins have remained constant or stable between quarter two and quarter three in a narrow range. Our Effective tax rate or ETR has actually improved from 22% to 21.3% in quarter three. Overall, our earning per share has grown at 4.2% on a year-on-year -year basis. We have had a strong performance in cash collection as well as a strong performance in billing. And as a result, both our unbilled revenue as percentage of revenues have improved, and our DSO days have also improved. Our operating cash flows were 101% of our net income. At the end of quarter three, we had $4.6 billion of gross cash and $2.8 billion of net cash. We had $3.4 billion of forex hedges as of 31st December, and we realized an exchange rate of 76.12 for quarter three. The board of directors has recommended an interim dividend of one rupee per share, as you would have read in the press. Uh, uh, in our press release. And our guidance for quarter four is 2 to 4% in the constant currency at the exchange rates which are mentioned uh, in the press release. We'll be very happy to take your questions here. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star, then one on their touchstone telephone. 
If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star, then two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who wishes to ask questions, please press star, then one. We take our first question from the line of Moshe Katri from Redwood Securities. Please go ahead. Moshe Katri, your line is unmuted. Please unmute the line from your side and proceed. Moshe Katri from Redwood Securities, your line is unmuted. Please unmute from your side and proceed with your question. As there's no response, we move to the next question from the line of Sandeep Shah from Aquarius Securities. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just a question in terms of uh, last two quarters, uh, we have actually exceeded the upper end of the guidance, and I do agree uh, that's a high base. While uh, this quarter, we are at midpoint of the guidance as a whole. So, is it fair to say, is it a high growth? Is it some deceleration in a small? Small tenure, faster conversion, deal rates, uh, deal wins are uh, a bit decelerating as a whole, which is impacting the growth. And even if I look at the current quarter guidance, on an organic basis, it looks like 1.3 to 3.3 percent as a whole. So, no, uh, uh, Sandeep, this is Cherry. Hi. So, so uh, you know, I, I really do not see any deceleration of our growth. I think you know. Uh, what we've done for the last uh, few quarters is we've guided uh, between two and four, and we've been consistent in, in, in guiding that. Sometimes you go a little up, you go a little down, but there's no real trend, uh, you know, that would go down uh, by any by any uh, mean. Uh, we haven't lost clients. We haven't, you know, terminated, you know, abruptly any deal or so on. We continue to grow. We've done fabulously in bookings, frankly, uh, with the best performance ever. And, 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 you know, that gives us the confidence that we can continue to, you know, guide on 2 to 4% for the next quarter. You know, keep in mind also, because, you know, obviously we are tracking performance on a quarterly basis. This is 28% growth over last year. So imagine the company, the transformation of the company in four quarters. Um, you know, if you go back five quarters, we actually have added a third of the repo revenue of that time uh, in a, in, to, to, to the overall days. So the company has increased by 30 by a third in, in five quarters. And I think, you know, you, you know it, it is, you know, the, the kind of growth that we've, that we've had and we continue to see the same trend going, going forward, frankly. Yeah, this is helpful, and we also acknowledge that the growth journey of Wipro has really turned around. Just a question further to that, in this era when Wipro has successfully turned around the organic growth, why are we depending on too much of inorganic growth as a whole? So, because in one of your media interviews theory, you also mentioned that uh, we may be open for another large size acquisitions, and in terms of smaller acquisition, we are keep doing as a whole. Why not focus in terms of improving the margins, improving the return ratios when the time has come where organic growth is easy to come rather than too difficult uh, with efforts which already being taken by you in terms of turning around the organic growth? That's Sandeep, yeah. yeah, Sandeep, it's two different things. Uh, we, we are not mixing our organic growth strategy with the inorganic uh, strategy. Those are two different tracks. Uh, you know, m and will never uh, be seen as a way to compensate for for grow, organic growth. The focus on the market, on the business, is to drive organic growth, and every of our business units are driving growth, and focusing on that. The m and strategy is to help us accelerate and you know gain and 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 you know accelerate in speed to uh, you know to to make jump in some strategic areas when we do an acquisition like agile okay agile brings you know expertise consulting expertise in cyber security area we have a strong cyber security practice we have you know a good business that is growing very well led by 
you know, a very strong leader, Tony Buffamante, uh, we feel that, you know, by adding this uh, consulting, uh, you know, business, it will allow us to have, you know, and, and be able to, to, to have a bigger impact in this market. And so that's really how we are seeing uh, uh, MNA. It's strategic. It's to reinforce and, and, and bring, you know, expertise we don't have and, and compress time. But it, it is not to compensate for organic uh, uh, growth. Yeah, thanks. And just the last question to touch in in terms of margin. I think even in this quarter, if we look at EBITDA margin, the decline has been 45, 50 bips versus last quarter being close to 70 bips. So the question is in terms of the margin outlook, uh, are we continuing the band of 17, 17 and a half, which may continue over the next four, six quarters, which we call out as a medium term, or we believe now there could be tailwinds because of growth as well as pressure addition, which we may doing the band has an upside potential rather than a downside potential. So, uh, Sandeep, uh, just in here, uh, you know, we have maintained uh, that we will, we will, you know, there could be quarterly variation, but this is a range that we think uh, margins are sustainable for our business. And uh, there is no change to it. Uh, you know, this year is going to be like previous two years uh, is going to be a year of its own pattern and, and pressure points and excitement. And we should remain uh, pragmatic and dynamic with uh, with the changing um, scenarios on the ground. Uh, so, you know, there is no change. Uh, fundamentally, we have always said that the first priority for us is growth. Uh, and uh, alongside, very clearly, uh, is talent. And uh, as we work through these two, uh, we also try and maintain the margin in, in the band that, that we have spoken about. Uh, and we have done a decent job around it um, uh, in current quarter, despite two months impact of wages, and that we have invested a little bit in additional uh, flexibility in utilization. As you can see, it's about 2.5% change from previous quarter, uh, which gives us some additional headroom for growth in quarter four and beyond. Uh, despite this two um, sort of investments on, on cost side, we have been able to remain in a in a narrow range on on operating margin. So I would say the uh, it's going to be a year dynamic year. We'll need to manage every quarter as it comes, but our uh, mid term uh, sort of range remains. Okay, thanks and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vibor Singhal from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Vinny sir. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Uh, so, the theory, my question was on the uh, deal flow uh, and the overall demand environment that we are seeing. Uh, we are hearing a lot of news, and uh, I think the anecdotal evidence also suggests that the large deals that we have seen in the last calendar year uh, in the Y20 impact, uh, uh, there have been very few and far between those kind of deals uh, in the last six to nine months. Uh, and what we are hearing is that uh, clients are breaking those deals into smaller size deals with smaller size and tenure as well. So, uh, are we also seeing similar kind of uh, uh, a pattern in the deal flow, and how does that impact our ability? I mean, is there more competition, more difficult to win those deals? How does that uh, basically impact our uh, overall uh, uh, strategy to grow over the next couple of years? Uh, and after that, I have a follow-up for Jatin. Thanks. Okay, okay. So I'll take that one on the uh, overall structure of the large deal. So, so what you know, uh, one is obviously you know the clients um, you know are. In every industry, clients at the moment are driving very actively execution of large transformation program. Okay, so it's not they're not in the design phase. They're not in building roadmaps. They are getting it done. So they are progressing and they want to see results. And so it's not uncommon indeed that you know clients feel that rather than going for a lengthy. Uh, uh, legal negotiation or, you know, building a three years roadmap or five years roadmap. Let's go ahead with six months, 12 months and see how things are going and we'll adjust along along the line. And so 
oftentimes we see clients indeed having a large transformation program in mind, but willing to contractualize through chunks as opposed to having a big one. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It's, it's, we're observing that at times they like to be pragmatic and go with, you know, a phase one, phased approach as opposed to uh, a big bang. That's all fine for us. It doesn't really change as long as we are able to, you know, um, structure the way we are developing and driving our, you know, our solution, uh, um, you know, the same way. But it, it, it's okay. It's okay. Frankly, uh, um, at the end of the day, uh, if, you, if you sign five times $100 million deal with a client or a $500 million deal with this client, it, it's about the same. Got it. So, in terms of effort as well, um, do you be, don't uh, you don't believe that uh, maybe chasing uh, smaller but uh, more number of deals would be, uh, let's say, a higher, uh, let's say, a pressure on our sales and marketing cost, and it could be probably uh, more difficult to uh, compete with the smaller companies, which probably aren't present there in large deals uh, anyhow. No, I don't think so. Frankly, I believe that. You know, when when we are going for a deal of us a five or seven years, it just gives you a little bit more uh, perspective and a little bit of time to really uh, uh, define the way you're gonna, uh, uh, you know, project your your investments. But frankly speaking, our clients are very mature and they know that well as well. And so when we are building and structuring the phase one or phase two. Uh, of a larger transformation program, uh, we are able to structure it in a way that it's in the context of a bigger and larger plan. So at the end of the day, I think it's not dramatically changing the way we, we work. And from a sales standpoint, I think, you know, it has its ups and downs. It has its upside and downside. If you sign one deal for five years, then you know you maybe do not have to come back to the negotiation table, you know, a year later. But when you do it regularly, you are able to adjust to the needs that are possibly changing over time a little bit or so. So it drives in more flexibility that can play for the client, like for the partner. So I think, you know, I'm not I'm not too concerned at all about that. I tend to look at those deals whether they are sold in once or in chunks as big deals, and, and, and I'm expecting our teams to work on it with the same mindset. Got it, got it. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, answering that question in detail. Justin, just one uh, so, 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 so quick question. Uh, you mentioned we have around $4.6 billion of cash on our balance sheet. Uh, uh, any uh, uh, basically outlook on uh, uh, basically enhancing shareholder return either by buyback or increase in dividend uh, in, uh, in future per se? Sure. So, you know, we have articulated that over a block of years, you know, we will continue to uh, uh, for sure return 50% uh, of our net income uh, to the shareholders. Uh, you know that over the last few years, we have returned even higher amount. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, for for the current quarter, the board of directors have gone ahead with with the with the recommendation of dividend one per share as as I spoke about it. Uh, okay. You know our approach to any other action or decision on cash uh, distribution is really uh, based on based on two aspects: the 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 quantum of cash on the balance sheet, and um, uh, second is around the need that we see over the next few quarters from a strategic uh, use. Uh, um, and investment standpoint, and whenever we feel that we we don't need uh, uh, an additional cash uh, beyond 50% of the net income, uh, you know we have gone uh, we have come to you all with with a proposal for buyback. But right now there is no such uh, proposal under active consideration. Otherwise, you would have heard about that. Uh, right now we have announced the dividend interim dividend of one rupee per share. Great, got it. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my questions and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Moshe Katri from Redbush Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for uh, taking my question. Happy New Year and uh, to you, Terry. Uh, bon année. Um, yeah. so, Thank you, Moshe. Uh, 
a couple of things. Um, first, you mentioned a 27% increase in TCV. Is there a way to slice it by new logos versus renewals? That's number one. And obviously, this is important. Just, you know, we, we wanted the renewal piece to, to be higher because it will drive growth. And then the other part of my question is focusing more on CAPCO. So maybe you can talk a bit about where are we in terms of uh, integrating CAPCO, uh, focusing on the cross-selling initiative that's going to be a big deal, and what happens to growth when it normalizes, i.e. fiscal 23, you're analyzing, uh, the, you're annualizing the contributions from CAPCO. So is mid-teens kind of a good number to kind of focus on from a big picture perspective? Obviously, we're not talking about guidance, but maybe from a long-term perspective. Uh, thanks for the color. Sure. Okay. Uh, it's a machine. So, so I'll, I'll ask Tiffany to go on question one around, you know, the type of deals uh, uh, we've closed. I'll take question two on Capco and question three on margin uh, projection. Okay. Tiffany, you want to go on um, number one? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so we're really seeing a mix of renewals, but also um, new logos and also new areas within existing clients. So I, I'm energized by the mix of uh, growth that we're seeing. Uh, we see a lot of um, a new, new clients placing their trust in Wipro on major transformation initiatives. And as Terry described, some of that is in you know, initial smaller chunks, and in some cases, it's large transformation deals. So I think it's a healthy mix of adding new clients as well as um, renewing existing business. So clients continue to place uh, their trust in us to continue to transform, um, but also they're bringing us into new parts of the organization. So um, that's what's driving a lot of our growth in our existing accounts, uh, but also, you know, adding, adding new logos. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, uh, Moshe, on the on the um, on the Capco question, um, what I can say is that you know now it's been what eight months uh, since the acquisition of Capco, uh, and frankly, uh, it's it's actually been a wonderful first year. Uh, the teams are working well. Uh, we have aligned. Uh, we have built common governance on the large accounts. We have. Um, uh, worked on uh, opportunities, uh, Capco and Wipro, DFSI together. Um, we have really uh, won some very nice deals, and we had we had a, a, a nice story of of deals shaping up in um, in the previous quarter. This quarter, beginning of this quarter, we really won a very significant transformation deal. That typically we would have never won um, uh, without uh, the other. So I'm pleased with really uh, the attention of the Capco team to the market. I'm very pleased with the performance of Capco team. I am pleased with the way the leaders are, um, you know, uh, engaging with the, you know, the larger WIPO organization and sensing there's a great. Um, uh, I would say uh, uh, there's there's a warm feeling for for the for the Capco team on the on the Wipro team. To me, it is a success, and not one single day I've been uh, you know doubting about the the the, the, the decision we, we we made, and and I think it it will continue to deliver results. So I would say obviously it's difficult to reflect after eight months. You know, uh, you will want to have more uh, uh, perspective, but frankly, it is very promising. And again, solid performance from Capco every month. Uh, your third point on margins, if I understood well, because uh, at some point in time, you, 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 at least for me, your voice broke up. But, you know, there's a question about, you know, you want to know where we're going in terms of margin. You you mentioned yourself the fact that you were not guiding yet for fiscal year 23. What I would say is that, um, you know, if you look at our margins, uh, we have been pretty consistent over the last six quarters, uh, guiding about 
you know, we guided around 19%, and then came CAPCO. We announced CAPCO's impact on margin was between 1.6 and 2%, and we've guided ever since, you know, on a, you know, arrow band between 17 and 17.5%, um, and we maintain our, you know, focus and our, you know, attention to this level of margin. So, you know, from that standpoint, Moshe, I would not be expecting uh, anything uh, 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 changing from, from, from where we are now. But, and also in that respect, in fiscal 23, the annual revenue contributions from CAPCO annualize. So growth rate will normalize. And the question here is whether we should use mid-teens growth rate for fiscal 23 and beyond as the right kind of range. Ah, because growth that, rate. The fact growth that it annualizes. Rate. Exactly. Growth exactly. rate. Look, uh, again, we've been communicating, we've been uh, guiding on 2 to 4% growth quarter after quarter for the last, for the last quarters. Uh, obviously, CAPCO has already normalized. It's not impacting those numbers anymore. Uh, I can tell you that we are maintaining this guidance for Q4. As you know, we are we have made as a practice to communicate on the you know uh, on a quarter of a, after quarter. So you'll have to be a little patient. But again, read yeah. read us. We are saying we are going for two to four percent quarter this quarter, and we are not seeing major change in the market. Understood. And we are performing Thank you very much. Well. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Devya Nagarajan from UBS. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question and wish you all a happy new year. Uh, Thierry, I think, I think you've kind of answered this question in different parts, but let me try and come at it from a different angle. So if you look at the last three, the, the quarters that we just reported, I think some of your peers have seen pretty strong surprises, or it is a, I appreciate a seasonally weak quarter. We don't really see those kind of surprises. Um, so I was just wondering, um, in your, from, from Wipro's perspective, why didn't those surprises come through? Was it a, a mix issue, or is it that we had, um, you know, some ramp ups that are already behind us? How should we think about this? Because we have, we have seen, at least so far in the earnings season, fairly broad-based uh, revenue beats, uh, from many of your peers so far. Yeah, you know, Divya, in some ways I feel that, you know, because, um, you know, when, when you're guiding on a certain level, you, you're giving a bracket, right? It's between two and four, and we've been guiding on two, uh, between two and four for uh, three, four quarters. If, you know, you're, you're, you're hitting the top end of the, of the guidance, then, you know, the next time the market is expecting that you'll do the same. The reality is that when we are managing our business, we are looking at our portfolio and we are looking at, you know, the trend and we are trying to guide really reflecting what we are seeing at the beginning of a quarter. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I cannot be uh, 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 unsatisfied with the fact that when I get two to four and I do three, I, I cannot be more accurate. <laughs> I think I was coming more from the point of view as I think with some of the others, the surprise seems to have come from demand during the quarter. Yeah. And I think yeah, but it, it, demand has not changed. I was wondering if there was anything in the portfolio that that kind of inhibited the pro from taking advantage of such a demand surprise. Yeah, Divya. One thing that is clear is that typically when you sign a mega deal, uh, it, uh, one quarter, it's not uncommon that one quarter or another, you have suddenly a massive bump uh, in your revenue. Uh, and so if you do not have this mega deal, you do not necessarily have this one shot big bump that, you know, maybe uh, uh, some other have, but or that we've had in some quarters. So, you know, if you look at uh, the difference let's say we've done, we've done a strong performance in sales. The difference with for example, the performance we did exactly a year ago uh, in Q3 of last year, it, it was a little lower than what we've done this year, but it had a $1 billion deal inside with uh, Metro. So 
Actually, it was coming to more or less the same number, a little lower, but you know, a comparable number uh, on on the PCB standpoint. But 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 coming from a large deal, uh, and therefore the performance outside of this large deal was very different. I think we've turned the, the engine into a way that we have more recurring type of deals uh, every quarter, so that you know the the mega deal comes on top. Right, uh, and and what's comforting is that if you look at you know the performance in sales, uh, even without mega deal, with you know 2.85 billion of ACV, we've done probably we've done 55 percent more than what we used to do on a given quarter a year ago. Hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, just yep. a question on attrition. Uh, I think you have discussed it again, but do you feel like from here on you 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 you're at a point where you're you find that attrition will be more manageable uh, and eventually start to uh, you know come off these heights? Yeah. So, so first of all, on this topic, Divya, I, I, you know, uh, I I I I tend to be cautious because. Um, you know, this, the decision lies with our employees and with the, empl the, the other employees of uh, of the market. But what I what what I believe, what we are seeing is that you know definitely um, the, the the level of attrition will moderate will moderate uh, in Q4, um, which is rather good news. Again, I don't want to cl to to claim you know victory on, on it. And I think we'll continue to stay very focused on it and and keep really an eye or two on on the situation of our of our employees in the organization and continue to connect as much as we can with them. Uh, but you know, when uh, a quarter ago I I was saying you know I don't I think it's here to last. I feel that it might actually uh, 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 stabilize if not slightly improve. So I'm I'm a little more optimistic than I was a quarter ago on that. Okay. Thank you, and wish you all the best for the year. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Agarwal from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good evening, uh, everyone, and thanks for taking my question. I would like to start with wishing everyone a happy new year and good health. So, Theory, I have a very, very simple question. Uh, when you see the current environment, when you engage with your clients, where do you see, you know, the transformation journey towards digital for the clients have reached? Means, uh, when we do our channel check, when we speak to global technology consultants and all, what we understand is that, you know, everyone is very excited to, you know, for the transformation journey. They want to, you know, link more and more of their revenues to technology, uh, generate more revenues through technology and platform. But that journey has just started. What is your sense in that? How do you see that? Do you think that the journey has already uh, been 30% behind or 50% behind, number one? Number two, if uh, the journey has just begun or even if it is at 30%, uh, what is your sense that how long uh, before this matures? It will be three years, four years, five years, or you think that you know uh, going forward the technology trends will keep on continuing? So what is your sense on that? So I'm asking more of a five, 10 year strategic thought process on how do you see the technology expense for client will be? Sandeep, uh, you know, the thing I have is that uh, technology is pervasive and is critical to the transformation of every industry at the moment. And there are multiple topics uh, 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 that, you know, that have, you know, CEO attention um, uh, today. The cloud journey is the best example because, you know, I remember even three, four years ago, Sandeep, um, cloud discussions were happening with the CIO. The CEO would not focus much on it because it was considered to be an infrastructure discussion and and that was a a, a back office uh, perceived as back office issue. Today, cloud is a way for organizations to be agile, to be to drive, you know, to be able to generate more opportunities, to be inventive, to develop solutions, connect with new clients, and it is 
across organizations. So, you know, I don't think I've seen yet a company that can say that it has reached 50% of the cloud transformation. I think it's obviously I'm not going to be able to give a percentage, but my feel is that we are still in the early stage of the cloud transformation across uh, industries. Um, and so it is a massive wave uh, ahead of us to a point that today, you know, when I when I look at the big hyperscalers who play a big role in cloud, you know, the 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 the, the, the Microsoft, the Google, AWS, ServiceNow, SAP, they are coming at us because they need us to help them develop vertical solutions on their platforms or on the cloud. And I think it is very clear that the more we do, the more uh, uh, opportunities uh, there are behind. That's for the cloud. And the growth in the cloud will be massive over the next five years at least, okay? Then we have, you know, the whole world of data. And we know that, you know, we are producing billions of, of data and, and, and we are very, we're leveraging very little the, the, the power of this data, turning them into insight to drive faster decisions. Companies have started to work on it, but it's, you know, very complex because uh, it requires alignments of processes and systems, you know, in comp and policies in those companies. And, you know, there's still a lot of level of complexity. And so the way we are helping companies to develop to become data-driven organizations is, you know, a huge uh, topic for us. And the last one is, and not saying the last one, but just say, taking a third one because I realized uh, the clock is, is ticking, uh, but is um, engineering. I mean, the need for organization to invest more in R&D for them to transform their you know, processes and product uh, developments to le by leveraging technology is immense. So, uh, you know, looking forward, I think we have a market that will, you know, be driven by talent and will, uh, you know, be very, very hot in the next years. Thanks, thanks uh, for that detailed answer and best of luck for the current quarter. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sumit Jain from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for doing my question and Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, can you split your uh, guidance of 2 to 4% into organic and inorganic, given the recent acquisition work you have already closed? Uh, no, we, we don't do that. We, we usually, uh, we, we, because, you know, no, we don't do that because it's very difficult to do that because at the end of the day, you know, these business, when they join an organization, they are part of the organization and they're driving, uh, you know, uh, uh, and we are driving synergies as from day one. So we are not reporting, unless those are very large acquisitions, we are not reporting separately. But I think, uh, Jackie, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, uh, Terry. Uh, so we we did did share the details about the acquisition when when we announced them. So I'm sure it gives you a good indication from our perspective, both internally and uh, uh, from the way we manage the the success in the market. We we stay with a with a with a one number, and hence the guidance we will uh, uh, we will not break down into the two components. But I'm sure you can you you would be able to. Uh, have some indication or not. Right, right. No, that's helps all. And secondly, I joined the call a bit late. So have you disclosed your deal when TCV number for this quarter? Uh, no, uh, Sumit, we, we haven't disclosed that. Uh, the number, we, we did speak about the ACV growth number, which is 27% for, for, for the first nine months. And we did share uh, the quantitative details around it, which was about $2.8 billion uh, on an aggregate basis for quarter three, and that we did in the press conference. Uh, so basically, no no disclosure for this quarter as well in terms of ECV or ACV. Yeah, the, the number that we that I just shared was for quarter three. 
the growth number that we had shared was for the first first year, uh, first nine months of the year. Got it, got it. And, and lastly, if I look at your EBIT margins, your D and D expense as a percentage of sales has been coming down for the last two quarters, uh, pretty sharply. So, any reasons why one and what kind of D and D expense as a percentage of sales one should expect going forward? Uh, so, uh, so the way uh, Zumit, you you would uh, appreciate is that when uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the amortization lines are uh, uh, are coming to an end of their tenor of over which we we take those amortization, then it leads to uh, then it leads to the reduction, which is step down reduction in in the number of amortization. It's not uniform, as you can see. Uh, that has happened over last two quarters for some of our prior uh, uh, capitalizations. Uh, my suggestion is that you should look at Q4 as a base because we have uh, two more acquisitions which are getting integrated from 1st of January. So you would see that number stepping up uh, a bit because they will come with their intangible uh, schedules uh, over over over. Uh, um, as, as we do the acquisition accounting for that, so Q4 should be a good base for you to build uh, your your model for future. You got it, got it. Thanks a lot, Jatin and Thierry, and all the best for the future. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was the last question. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Aparna Ayer for closing comments. Thank you, Stanford. Um, we understand that it must have been very hectic for uh, many of you as you've had to take uh, simultaneously attend multiple results that have been announced today. So thank you all for joining the call. If you have further questions, do not hesitate to reach out to the investor relations team. Stay safe and stay healthy, and we'll see you next quarter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Wipro Limited, that concludes this conference. We thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.